Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, Episode 7. One of the big problems that farmers have, period, is they often think of themselves as, as, as beef farmers or sheep farmers, when the reality in the regenerative uh, version of that is you're actually a soil farmer or a grass farmer. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers produce forages for livestock. I'm Cal Hardy's host of the Grazing Grass Podcast. And we're glad you're here today. On today's episode, we talk with John Lakey of Lakey Farms in Australia. He is our first guest from outside the United States. John's going to talk about his operation, what they're doing, and what they plan to do. If you've not subscribed to our podcast, please subscribe. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we encourage you to share our post. Before we get to interview, one thing to note is that partway through the interview, my mic decided to die. Luckily, we were able to, to go ahead and get the interview recorded. John, we want to welcome you to the Grazing Grass Podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your operation? I was going to, you asked me about the farm. I'm happy to talk about the farm. Okay. So um, my, you can cut and edit this later on, Cal. So my father was a soldier settler after the Second World War and came down to Sunbury where we are now. Um, so we're, we're on the outskirts of Melbourne. Um, and Melbourne used to be 20 or 30 kilometres away, and now the outer suburbs are 5 or 10 kilometres away. So uh, what they call peri-urban, I think. Oh, yes. Probably lots of similar issues to... To, in the US. Um, so uh, we're on the volcanic plains here, which is uh, basalt clays with lots of rock and stones. And I parked my little four-wheel drive on one the other day that I didn't see in the grass, oh. which is annoying, but it's a yes. very good problem to have is to have lots of feed. So we're, we're coming out after a run of seasons where we've had wet winters and, and, and dry or cold springs and no, we, we want warm rain or uh, warm conditions and rain, which we're getting this year. Oh, well, very so good. It's a marvelous year for us. So, what are you yep. producing on your farm? Yep. So, we're on 600 acres here. Oh, we're producing, uh, uh, we run a, a breed of Ryland sheep, an old English breed, which are fantastic eating, um, some Sane and goats, and we're starting a small dairy herd based around Jersey cattle. And then the offspring are going into our meat program. It's a uh, a beef jersey cross, and we've been using Salers bulls for the last few years, and they've produced a fantastic calf. Uh, we grow them out for two, two and a half years. Oh, yes. And then yes. we run them into our meat business. What brought you to those particular breeds? Well, what we're trying to do is develop a dual-purpose uh, farm. So we, we want our sane and goats will produce uh, cheese as well as, um, as well as milk, and the same with with our cattle. So we'll actually, we hope to milk them. And there's a big demand now um, for, uh, well, I, I have to pasteurise the milk, but for un, unhomogenised um, milk from farms in Victoria, the huge demand in the city. So we, we've got, got a pretty good market. Oh, yes. And to some extent, that was a little bit of a mind change from looking at the city and, and, and the peri-urban situation as a, as a problem and seeing if there's some way that we could use the proximity of having a, a four million person market on our doorstep. Uh, and that's probably the biggest change is to think about about how to exploit the fact where we are because we're not going to get bigger. It's it's not viable to buy more land. If we do that, we'll have to go out. Right. And even then, if you do get bigger, I see some of my Twitter family talking about selling wheat at 1980s prices today. Oh, yes. So this sort of commodity pricing is, is shocking. It's not moving. And it's an international market. So you guys are getting the same pressures that we are. And we're looking at the calf at foot model. I don't know if you know much about that. Tell us more about it. Uh, well, basically, you get the bulk of your milk overnight. So what we'll do is leave the cow, the calf on the cow during the day. So we'll milk once a day, and that becomes an ethical treatment of animals. I'll do the inverted commas. Uh, and also cuts our workload back. Apparently, the yields in the afternoon are nowhere near as big as the, the morning yields. Oh, okay. Which is what I used to notice when I was hand milking. So the argument would be with the prices so low as a commercial farmer, you milk once a day, uh, and, and that, that's where you get the bulk of your return, and you don't have to have the investment of milking in the second afternoon. Oh, yes. 
And, and that what that does is these dairy cattle have got enormous amounts of milk. They can simultaneously give milk to you and raise a calf. Oh, yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? It does. So we end up with a beef product now, um, and that's why we're looking at pushing that beef model. And also then I've worked in abattoirs where they've, they've slaughtered potty calves, uh, um, taken away from their mums, and it's a horrible. As a farmer, it's not something I'd endorse. Oh, yes. And you're just getting started on the dairy part, or have you done that for a little while, or the milking? The dairy's in our plans for the next 12 months. Oh, yes. Um, so we're building a house on another block of land, and we'll be setting up a dairy there, which we, we hope at this stage, uh, we speak um, naively, I think, Carl, I'd say, we intend to move that around and on a skid and take that out to the cattle on the farm. Oh, yes. yeah. And then, then break the milk back if we... If we can, if we can find a, an affordable pasteuriser, we'll bring the milk back and process that on site. Otherwise, we'll look around and see if we can tap into another small dairy that has a bottling plant at Ballarat, not far from our other farm. Oh yes, yeah. And I assume raw milk sales are yeah. illegal there. Uh, yes, unfortunately, yeah. yes, they are. Even though we probably both grew up drinking right, raw milk, right? We don't have too many issues. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just seen as carte blanche, and I don't know why. Um, it, it drives me a bit nuts that, that they that do this because, I mean, you've got 300 million people in, in Europe that live on raw milk. Oh, yes. And raw milk cheeses. Yeah. And they're pretty weird, but they're not, you know, they're not dying off in, the, in their hundreds. I think some of your states, you can sell raw milk or not? Yeah, some you can. It varies by each state. One, one of the things we, we seek, we, we're seeking to do because we sell our, our marketing is vertically integrated so i spent a lot of time in the wine industry yes where we we plant the vineyard we grow the grapes we pick the grapes we make the wine we, we market the wine and sell that as a product and everyone cares whether the wine was picked from that side of the hill or this side of the hill it's hugely important when it comes to wool or to milk or to meat they don't care the market doesn't care but because we sell direct we know that our product has to have flavour. Oh, yes. And, and that, that's why this issue about grazing and grass-raised animals is about trying to build flavour into the animal uh, because I'm looking at it purely from a, a human consumption endpoint um, and we want the most interesting, healthiest life experience for the animal right. but also at the same time build complexity. Yes. And, and of course, the cliche is that the, the more broad the pasture the animals are grazing, then there's a much greater chance that they'll have, they'll have a more interesting, interesting taste. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and whilst I'm reluctant, I'm, I'm reluctant to, um, I'll say, slag or to criticise feedlotters, um, often in Australian pubs we'll have beautifully marbled beef. A pub is a hotel. But they, they always sell it with a sauce. Oh, so you yes. you can't get a steak. They always have pepper sauce mushroom sauce and I said well if the meat had any bloody flavor why would you need the sauce <laughs> right yeah, yeah? Uh, you mentioned your your forages yeah. you want the the animals to eat a wide variety what kind of forages do you have there our uh, the part of the farm that I'm running at the moment is mostly um, unimproved pasture so it's basalt plains with a lot of weedy grasses we have a, a turf grass called uh, bent grass which is very dominant, and that can end up with up to 30 tonne per hectare, according to the Ag Department, of, of root mass. So it oh, actually blocks yeah. everything else out. Yeah. Um, but, on, but we have a, a vast array of remnant native grasses, which is what we're looking to bring back in. And that's wallaby grasses, kangaroo grasses, red-legged grasses. Um, the, the first one is, is uh, kangaroo grass is a C4. It's a summer active grass. Uh, Bothrochloa macra is a summer active grass at C4. Uh, the wallaby grasses, and there's another one that's very common here uh, called weeping grass, is actually it's a, um, a pretend C4. Oh, so a okay. lot of the native grasses will react to their perennials and they'll react to summer rainfall. Oh, yes. Whereas a lot of the exotic grasses, although coxfoot, uh, fescues and uh, phalaris can all be very good grasses if they get a bit of summer rain, but much of our pastures will burn off in, in summer and we won't see any activity in the pastures until early early autumn. So I heard Lauren Steinlager Stein Stein well, kind of Lauren talk about our summer being equivalent to your winter. Oh yes. So it can be so hostile that that nothing much moves. And the idea in Australia is to try and look at ways um, to rehydrate the landscape so we get all year round grass growth. Oh yes. So so what we're trying to do now incorporating some of the techniques that savory talks about or holistic grazing where you graze hard then rest um, with a little bit of burning 
um, a little bit of cover cropping. So we're doing some fodder cropping. Um, I'm about to sow down a mixed cover crop full of millet, sorghum, sunflowers, clovers. It's about eight seed mix. But the problem I have at the moment is my pastures are growing so vigorously, I don't have a chance to get them in, get them into the paddock. Oh, yes. Right? So I'll be doing that in a, in a month. In a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time. And so where, where we are too, I didn't really introduce the area. We're about a 550 millimetre rainfall. It's about 20 inches a year. Oh, okay. It tends to be spring dominant, but it's pretty even every month of the year. We might get um, 100 mil of rain in January or February, or we could just as easily get it in June or July. Oh, okay. Our climate is, is very... Uh, so we're on the bottom end of Australia, and we tend to get Antarctic influences. So we could get a 30-degree change in temperature. Oh, yes. In a day. So we could be 40 degrees one day, 10 or 15 the next day. That's in Celsius? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure to convert it to Fahrenheit. That's, that's fine. Well, Celsius works. So it would be about 110 Fahrenheit. Come back. Yes. Yeah, it yeah. would be well, somewhere around the that. The Americans are interesting. Hang on to your old unit. We do. We do. So the management here on the grazing is we're gradually moving the farm into more intensive grazing paddocks down to 10 to 20 acre paddocks. Oh, yes. Um, with their own water and reticulation supplies. Um, because we tend to get very cold southerlies and southwesterlies and or alternatively hot or cold northerlies, depending on the time of the year, I've put my windbreaks east-west uh, and we're looking at using a lot of Australian native trees. We've got some of the most wonderful flora. I'm not so fond of the fauna on the farm as much, but the flora is fantastic. Um, that host a lot of beneficial insects. So we're looking at incorporating, uh, I suppose, a holistic approach. Oh, yeah. So we're trying to avoid using herbicides and fungicides and insecticides, but saying that I'm about to spray a vineyard with copper and uh, copper oxychloride and sulphur um, to protect vineyards. But they're like roses, fine. So they're very, very um, sensitive soils, unlike most of our pasture species. Oh, yes. So the, 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 the feeling at the moment is to try and move away from uh, fertiliser enhanced pasture growth, if you like, and try and find flavour by going into a, um, uh, well, it's a regenerative approach. Right. In our grasses. Mm. But at the same same time, we're in a, 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 to me, I'm sitting here, I haven't had a haircut for six weeks, so uh, we're, we're sitting here trying to work out, well, what's my next step? I'll probably go out and spray top the bent grass do you know much about this technique at all, Carl? No, I don't. Um, so what we need to do is, like a um, person setting a, you want to pull some grasses back and some allow to go forward. So when we spray top, sometimes called pasture freezing, but when we spray top the bent grass, it flowers very late. So if we spray top that in uh, just as it's about to flower, it stops the plant setting seed. Uh, so it keeps it in a vegetative growth cycle which means that when the cattle come through and graze it, the protein is still in the stem, not in the seed head. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what we're trying to do by, by selectively doing that, we're trying to let grazing then come through and they'll take out all this, the grass surface, which otherwise would have gone to seed and be unpalatable, very low proteins. They'll eat that and what they start doing is exhaust <coughs> the root mass. So it has to then use energy to grow again. Oh, yes. Right. right. And what we do, so by not... Uh, and, of course, these paddocks are full of rock, of basalt, bluestone. Okay. So I can't plough these paddocks. I've got to be careful even taking a spray unit over the top. Oh, yes. Uh, and what, what I'm hoping, hoping to do over time, I break down that dominance of the grass I don't like, and then I open up the opportunity for some of the remnant native grasses to germinate and start to grow. Oh, yes. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a little of bit that. of success with that now. Um, having, yeah, um, so I'm seeing more wallaby grasses, more weeping grasses, more of the native grasses coming through that are often, um, I won't say poly, they're, they're, they're these fantastic grasses that will grow all year round and they'll respond to summer rain. Now, um, I'm sure perhaps similarly to us in the US, we had some fantastic grazing results early on, but because everyone set stock, they destroyed the pastures that, that brought the, 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 uh, the high yields. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. And part of Alan Savory's approach to me, and I think there are probably many disciples, Cal, um, of, of this common sense approach is to reduce inputs. Part of it, the attraction is to say, well, well, let's use what's there because at the end of the day, I don't get paid by the kilo. 
Um, well, I do, but I don't get paid like a like an average farmer. You sell the product and it's gone. I talk face to face with the customer, right? And at that stage, I have to hand sell the product, and I get a chance to talk about how we farm and if you can taste the difference. So it's very oh, important yes. that we can we're not fooling ourselves that we have a different product, a better product. Right. Yeah. And and that's I know I have that because I'm getting repeat sales. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. You also have the sheep. So are you grazing the sheep and the, the cattle together? Are you grazing them separate? No, we, we try and run we, we run the sheep, the goats, and the cattle together, but I calves individually and I lamb individually. Although okay. I'm running the goats and the, they're, they're kidding at the moment, the goats. Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, I've found in the past that I'm, if I'm supplementary feeding, the cows will take over a feeder and one of the other animals at it. So if I'm sup feeding in with hay in winter, then I'll break the herd, break the flocks up. But otherwise, I'll graze them all together so I can try and get on top of the feed and have the the, the uh, multi species grazing, I suppose, going on all at the same time. And with the hope that the goats will take out the thistle th- seed heads and some of the woody weeds, and the cattle will get that high impact grazing. I'm a little bit understocked this year, so it's going to be interesting. I've run some ring lines up, but the sheep drive me nuts because they just walk through them. Oh yes. Drives me some hot wires, um, cotton string wires. So, uh, so they're lucky they taste so good, <laughs> Cal. Otherwise, yeah. Do, do, do they hold the goats pretty good? Uh, the, the, yes, the goats are good. But what happens is you just need one bad egg and you're gone. Right, right. They just all walk through it after that and they smash it. Yeah. Um, but I'll spend a bit more time in the paddock. I, I might buy a paint gun, something like that, so I can find the sheep that I don't like. Although I put cattle tags on the ewes, so we spend a lot of time. Um, monitoring the performance of individual animals. So I know all the animals that have calved. All the, usually the cows are pretty good. Right. But also all of the sheep. So I know which animals uh, dropped a lamb and then walked away from it, and they, they come into our meat program. As I say in the market, people don't like to hear this, but I, talk, I like to use the words butchered, slaughtered, because if you're a human and you're eating meat, you're part of the deal. You can't, you can't opt out. Uh, I know a lot of people like the word processing. Right, yeah. But I kind of feel it's a bit mealy-mouthed. Yeah. I'm taking a life to sustain a life. Right. That's true. And people need to, to step, step up for it. Um, uh, we had a pet lamb in a market at Coburg a couple of months ago, and people were saying, well, I couldn't buy lamb because you had a lamb there. And we had her because she was in was ill. Unfortunately, she didn't make it, although she fed well that day. But we um, constantly seek to improve all those aspects of the business. So I got off topic. Uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> Well, we were talking about grazing your... Mixed grazing. Yes, mixed grazing. Um, look, a couple of years ago, I had some goats kidding, and the steers were tremendously interested in the in the kidding goats, and, and they drove the mothers away from the young and actually broke the legs of the young oh, no. uh, young kids. But um, that's one of the... Um, but they were steers. They're complete whackers. The cows are much more um, settled and, and easygoing. I don't think we'll have any problems there. Um, the calves could be a bit of a trouble. And sometimes because of the size difference, we can have some issues. But uh, my fencing here is, is a, uh, a mesh fence and we have an electric hop wire on top. So it tends to be pretty good to block um, most species going through. So I don't have the issues. I think a lot of, a lot of places I see use um, barb, lots of barbed wire fences in the US or is it a bit more mixed than that? Yeah, a lot of five wire barbed wire fences. A lot of our, we tend to steer clear of those a little bit, and a lot of our farmers will use plane wires. Oh, um, yes. But you need to be in a situation, plane wires, then, then electrify them. But you need to be in a position where you can monitor that because once the fence goes down, it's a psychological barrier, not a physical barrier. Right. Uh, that's how they're built. Once the fence is electric out of it, it doesn't take the animals long, and certainly if you've got heifers and bulls, to work out whether there's any charge in the fence. But the sheep are on a mesh fence, which is a physical barrier. But as I'm finding with goats, I've had to redesign and, and can keep redesigning fences. The goats are so flexible, so nimble, and so agile and smart that they're quite difficult <laughs> to keep in. They are. They um, are. But it, it pays. Oh, they're, they're the challenge. And I often look at my wife. I noticed that they were all in a windbreak around a dam where I'd revegetated, grazing my trees. I'm looking at my wife thinking, if I had a rifle that day, I would not have been <laughs> responsible for what I was doing. Yes. But as these goats have gotten older, they're, they're a little bit less, um, well, a little bit less flippity gibbet. They tend to stay in the paddock where you put Oh, them. well, very good. Yes. Yeah. There's a fantastic demand for goat meat locally. Oh, yes. 
Uh, and sometimes in the markets, we, it's a little bit of a niche because everyone's got lamb and beef, but we're, we're the only people in most of the markets we sell in um, that have goat. Oh, yes. So um, it, it's been an interesting di- diversification. Grazing management of all these animals will probably end up spending... I'm not quite at that high pressure grazing level yet that um, some of the um, experts talk about. With, with you know, got 500 pounds, I think um, Gabe was talking about, or a million pounds of animal there for half a day. We'd probably end up with. Um, I'll talk about. Do you, do you use dry sheep equivalent at all as a as a way of measuring the number of animals a pasture can carry? We do not. Not here. We use animal units here, which uh, animal units basically a a okay, beef cow. Okay, and what? So, how many sheep would equal a beef cow? Uh, about six, five or six. It just depends on what university did the research. Well, across Australia, we'd use a term called dry sheep equivalent, which would be a dry ewe or a merino. So, a ewe without lambs would be one DSE. A ewe with lambs would be two or three DSE. Uh, a steer or a bullock could be uh, ten DSE, uh, up to fifteen. And a milking cow with a carpet foot could be twenty DSE in her grazing demand. Oh, yes. So so at the moment, we'd be running about 600 DSE on 20 acres with goats and cattle and kids lambing. I, I'd like to get that up much higher and graze more short term, but uh, I've got other issues, planning issues in the background that we're working towards as well. And once you get under 20 acres, even on a small farm like myself, uh, the paddock it can be quite irritating to sow it down. If it's a five-acre paddock, all you do is turn corners. Yeah. So on a 20-acre paddock with my cedar, I can sow that down in three-quarters of a day. So it works. And ultimately, I'm planning to use some of these portable troughs that I've seen on, on in discussion groups and on the web and then more intensively graze with younger beef animals or something that won't go through fences all the time. Oh, yes. Also looking into uh, using fodder trees. So I'm sure a Tagasaski or Tree Lucent is, is getting a bit of a reputation. It's a high-protein tree. Uh, and also we've got lots of native trees in Australia that we, we have high protein as well. Some of the salt bushes, these are typically used on areas that are degraded and they're used, to, they're ripped back in and these trees are resistant and it gives people a long rest period and then the, the trees can be grazed should they run into troubled times and also a way of rehabilitating salted areas. Oh, yes. Um, damaged areas. Not, not, not a big issue in my part of Australia. But it certainly is an issue. Once I get a couple of hours north of here, then there's certainly salt scolds that are not uncommon. So in your area, you have mainly pasture with a lot of rock. I mean, besides urban spread, but mainly pasture with quite a bit of rock in it. And then you're planting windbreaks. Yep. Yeah, well, 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 this area here, Carl, is, is the basalt plain. So it's volcanic soil. Oh, okay. With patches of red volcanic soil that are fantastic. We're about 400 metres altitude, so we, we rise quite quickly. But we have these heavy, wet soils that go, I've heard them described as midday soils. I don't know where I've got this term from, but they're too wet before midday. They're perfect at midday and they're too dry after midday. <laughs> That's a good term for it. <laughs> when I started reading about a farmers trying to build organic matter and rehydrate soils, then my ears pricked right up because I'm looking to improve soil texture. And, and increase organic matter, all that stuff so it was singing to the choir here when I, when I started listening to that sort of approach. There isn't, there's a lot of traditional farming, I'd say, with a lot of fodder conservation. But after looking at what I've done here in the last few years, my, my pasture hay was only about 3 or 4% protein. So it wasn't very good. And I think a lot of stuff that gets cut in the region is more to fill cattle up, oh, not, yeah. to, not to fatten them. And it's, uh, I'm not sure how often people look at their analysis of their fodders, but it's it's a problem that I, I, I get the cattle. The sheep won't eat it, and the cows will take a belly full because it's there, like standing at a bar, and they'll empty the feed. Right. Yeah, so trying to improve those proteins because one of the, the feedbacks that we have is we're selling 10 to 15 lambs a month through the CSA and through, through farmers' markets. So we're not like your traditional farmer here who will take the entire flock, they'll, they'll draft the lambs off and they'll sell all the lambs in December or January or whenever they're finished. And then their stocking rate goes from 600 animals, for example, they'll halve that stocking rate, they just keep the mothers, all the lambs go. We have a constant grazing pressure because we're either trying to get ewes ready to join or we're trying to fatten lambs or we're trying to finish ewes so they're able to, to, to lamb properly on good condition. So we start to break our flocks up when 
when we've got those conflicting needs. So in the last month or so with sheep, you can't have them on too good a pasture or the mothers get too fat and the lambs are too big. Oh, so you yes. end up with a whole lot of lambing problems. And when, uh, when the ewes have lambing problems, they also then have uh, parenting, mothering problems. So this year, for example, we've joined our maidens in June. They're, they're a polyesterous, so they're an English breed of sheep. They won't join 12 months of the year. They only join in the, in the, the days shorter getting months. shorter uh, months, which is in our autumn, so your spring and summer. Um, so we joined our maidens in June, about 80% joining rate, at, at, sorry, in June at 10 months of age. Uh, and we've only had two problems with lambs at the moment. And about 30, I think there's 30, uh, 46 of those. Um, and most of those are lambing really well and mothering really well in a paddock on their own. But because I've got them in their own paddock in a small flock, they're mothering well, but it means I've messed up my holistic grazing approach of having all these hoof prints on the same paddock at the same time. Carl, you dropped out. Can you hear me, Carl? I can't hear you. Have you muted yourself, Carl? I don't think I've done it. It was here that my mic decided to die. But we were able to continue the conversation with John, uh, replying to our famous four questions. So our very first one, what's your favorite grazing grass-related book or resource? I'm a bit I'm a bit of a teenager in the sense that in terms of books, uh, I tend to chuff through a fair few. I think it's it's sometimes people become um, um, they become a bit obsessed with the next conference or the next book or the next experience. And whilst it's always good to lean over the fence and talk to people, what I've started to try and do now is is actually started putting into into gear using stuff I learned years ago. But I've always been thinking about or how do I do that and what's the perfect timing for it? And now I tend not to worry so much about timing and more about just having a crack at it and see how it worked. What did you learn? Look, I suppose one of the best books I've read would be Gabe Brown's book, um, Is It Dirt to Soil? Um, he writes really, really well, really readable and approachable. Um, I'm, I'm knee deep in Holistic Grazing by Alan Savory, but he actually makes you think. It's a real brain torture to um, to actually sit down and be honest about why you're doing what you're doing and, and what, what are the outcomes that you want because often you get stuck on a treadmill and you don't think about these issues. I've got um, I've got a stack of books over in front of my um, uh, entertainment area, which I'll have, have to work my way through, including quite a few books about Australia. Um, there's a chap here who's written a book, Bruce Pascoe, has written a book about how the Indigenous Australians, what we call the Aboriginal Australians, how they survived and what the, what pasture species and plants they lived on, uh, and why it is that in Australia we virtually don't cultivate a single native plant. Um, I think macadamias might be one, but they were taken to Hawaii and, and bred up there, not, not in Australia, and we brought the species back to Australia. There's probably on one hand you could list the species that they lived on for, we think, now 60, 70,000 years. Um, we, we've only, there's probably a handful of species that we use, uh, and people are look at, looking at farming, things like kangaroo grass. Um, I'd love to do a kangaroo grass beer. Um, so kangaroo grass is also elephant grass in Africa. Um, I'd love to do a kangaroo grass beer because you'd absolutely kill with the millennials. It'd be uh, money for jam. Uh, to answer your question, though, I really like Gabe Brown's book. There's a sense of wonder in the way Gabe Brown writes that I, that I really enjoy. I think it's it's a big part of farming that you don't have everything under control and you're in, you're in he'll say, God's hands. I know you Americans are very fond of your gods. Uh, God, I should say. I'll have to maybe edit that out, Cal. I could be in trouble. Um, but there's stuff that's so much out of your control. You, 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 can't, you can't deal with the rain. You can't deal with the floods, the hailstorms, the winds. I mean, effectively, farmers get a pandemic every season. Somewhere, I saw incredible floods that were destroying silos in the US last year. Uh, something that you plan for and, and you live with, and God knows how we do. The second of our famous four, what tool could you not live without on your farm? Um, what tool could you not live without on your farm? Look, I, I hate to say it because I, I really don't enjoy it, but crunching numbers on a laptop using Excel without getting too far into it is a big part about just tracking our breeding and our progress of our farm animals. So especially with sheep now, 
we're, we're still only small players, but we've got a couple of hundred ewes. Um, and just to work out which of those. Which we bred up from 14. Uh, so we've actually increased our flock from, from a handful of sheep up to, 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 to 200. They drive me nuts, but I keep track of who the mothers are and who the good mothers are. Uh, and, and I start to slaughter. The ones that don't perform go out of the flock. And we'd like to think with our maiden ewes this year, we've taken a huge step forward in coming up with a program that we can reproduce. So I, I could say a pH meter or a soil sampler or a, a ground tension device, but I suppose it's what, what's between your ears, isn't it? My wife's tapping her head saying it's, what's between the ears is what's important. What would you tell someone just getting started? One of the big problems that farmers have, period, is they often think of themselves as, as, as beef farmers or sheep farmers, when the reality and the regenerative uh, version of that is you're actually a soil farmer or a grass farmer. Um, and the biggest thing for, for becoming a good grass farmer is you've got to learn the grass species and, and what their needs and requirements are and how you can graze and manipulate that system to get a good outcome for whatever animal that you're putting over the top of it. Does that make sense, Carl? So people often say things like that's the native grasses and what they're looking at is a paddock full of weedy grasses, none of which are native and none of which are very good pasture grasses. It's just the remnant pastures that have survived a couple of hundred years of flogging in Australia, possibly could even be longer over in, in parts of the US or other parts of the world. So the best thing people can do, I think, to become a good grass farmer, and there's a second issue there that I mentioned early on, how do you get 21st century prices in a market that's, let's say, mid-1980s. And, and that's the struggle too. So you somehow or other have to value add. And, and that can be very tricky. Uh, I'm down the pathway here. If we keep rolling along successfully, we'd love to build a micro abattoir. So we could slaughter and vertically integrate our entire production and control it. So next year we plan to have our own boning room up. So we can boning room. So we set up our own butcher shop on farm with a commercial kitchen so we can value add to all the bits and pieces at the moment. So to exploit, so my wife's got a wall of preserves here and she's, we're doing soaps and stuff like that. But we'd love to start doing other products that in Australia require us to have a commercial license and a burning room. So this grass farming thing is, is you're chasing flavour, but if you're turning off a really good animal, why would you just sell it to an abattoir and, and they'll put it to a butcher and you don't get any credit? The thing about it is, is somehow or other to make that money, that value adding stick in your hands. And I, I think this concept of, of, of trying to make farming attractive, so hopefully more younger people will get into it. And what, what drives people out of farming is, is that there's no money there. The returns are not taken by the farmer. And I've read some stuff from papers from ATRA, from one of your websites in the US, where they reckoned in the, in the 1915, people were getting about 50% of the retail price would go to the farmer. I'd hate to think what that value is today. Because food, uh, and these issues are, are universal issues. If, if you go around the world, all the farmers are grey beards or older. And that's a big issue for the world. It's a big issue. There's a whole lot of knowledge and experience will disappear, Cal, and it won't come back and it won't be replaced by corporate farms. And it won't be, certainly won't be replaced by whatever the latest vegan burger being produced is. I'd like people to start connecting back to farmers. And that means, I'm not sure, I think farmers markets and CSAs are huge in the US. We've actually set a model up here where we invite people out. They can come and have a picnic on the farm as long as they don't mind the snakes. Well, COVID set all that back, Cal. Schools, we don't mind. Come and have a look at the farm. This is how we farm. Maybe then you give people some information, some contacts to say, well, I know what social media people are saying, but this is actually what happens on a farm. This is how it works. And some of it isn't good for the animal, but a lot of it is is we'll try and make it um, – uh, give the animal the best life they have. So I think uh, they end up having one bad day in their entire life. And that's their trip to the abattoir. In fact, with the sheep, they're often not even aware of that. It's more like one bad moment. Where can others find out more about you? Ah, okay, Cal. The last one is, yes, we're on we're on Facebook. We're on uh, website. We've got, um, there are plenty of lakeys in the US, I've discovered. So we've got lakeyfarm.com. So we Australians have hijacked the American commercial website. We're on Instagram as, as Lakey Farm and also on Facebook. Um, I follow, I'm on Twitter, but I'm a bit of a rabble rouser on Twitter, so you'd probably want to leave me alone there. 
certainly depending on which way your politics go. It's, it's exciting times, Carl, at the moment, around the world, politically, I think, unfortunately. I don't know if you know the old Chinese curse. May you not live, may you live in exciting times is, is the curse. You really want things to be mundane. You milk the cow, you cut the hay, that's it. Round it goes. Snows and it dries off again. No exciting times. So we're on Instagram as Lakey Farm, on Facebook as Lakey Farm, uh, website lakeyfarm.com. We've got a brilliant young lady that does a lot of the social media for us, and she also does a lot of our wine labels as well. So Claire's, I don't know how we got by without her. She's fantastic. Um, so it means Tris and I can run the farm and run the business and grow the business now. Uh, and, and a lot of the social media stuff gets looked after for us, which today is, is a big part of doing business door. anywhere. It's your front door. And the fantastic thing about Facebook, love um, Mr. whatever his name is, is it, it allows you to put your product in front of hundreds of thousands of people. They may not like it. You may get some horrible responses, but you can always block them. But it gives you an, an opportunity to communicate with people that was just not, a, not possible going back 10 or 15 years, Carl. And that's how we started this conversation marvelling at the technology and the changes. What I'd love to find out was that farmers doing the CSA model are into what they call the subscription economy. Right? So you, you, you're like Netflix. You can sell the same product over and over and over again. And it's one of the reasons we'd like to start doing milk because we don't have to slaughter the animal to get the product. Thank you, John, for today's interview. We really appreciate it. And I want to thank John for dealing with the technical issues we had. You just listened to the Grazing Grass podcast, helping grass farmers produce forages for livestock. Be sure and visit our website at grazinggrass.com. And for all of our listeners out there, please subscribe if you're not subscribed. Also share this episode. You can find Grazing Grass on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We post about each episode on there. Take one of our posts and share it. We greatly appreciate it. Also, we've added on the website a spot for you to ask your question. I know you're listening out there and you're thinking, Cal, you messed up. This was a great time for this follow-up question. Now it's your opportunity. Go to the website and put in what guest you thought I should have asked a question to, and what question I should have asked them. And if you'd like to go one step further and hear your voice on the podcast, record an audio file telling us who you are and what question you want to ask. And lastly, but most importantly, we are looking for guests. If you know someone, or maybe even you, who's using... Uh, rotational grazing, you are using regenerative agriculture, you are a grass farmer. Go to the website, click on Be Our Guest, and find out more about how you can be on our podcast. And until next time, keep grazing.